G'day champions. Today we've got an Ampeg SVT3 Pro in for a just check and service. I've already taken, taken the knobs off. Uh, we're just going to give it a visual inspection first and we're going to go through the procedure and just give it a test and check that everything's healthy. Uh, reportedly there's a bit of crackling happening with various controls. We'll check the effects loop uh, isn't, you know, uh, cutting the signal when it shouldn't be, that kind of thing. First we'll just check the fuse ratings as we do a visual check. So we've got 100, 120 volt, 125 volt fuse T10A. But we're on 220 to 240 volt, so that should be a 250 volt fuse and T5A. So that's time delay 5 amp. What do we actually got? We've got a 4 amp. It's not blown, but uh, it's underrated. No, that's funny. Normally, normally fuses that I find in amps are overrated, if anything, because one blows and they put a bigger one in, which is a very, very bad idea. But anyway, so having a look at the front, just notice they've got tiny little 4.75 mil pot shafts, a little bit like a PV, and this tiny, tiny little shaft on this switch here, not probably not even 3mm, it's probably an eighth of an inch with a flat spot on it, that's, uh, that's for the, the uh, mid-range frequency selector. Um, we've got the graphic EQ here with the invariably broken slider, at least one of them this time, not all of them. And I notice these sliders are moving a little bit too much. You push on them and they, they move. So having a look inside, this whole panel here that holds the sliders is held on by probably the pissiest way of holding on a board I've ever seen. Uh, you've got two brackets which are just soldered to the main board and they've got screws going into the brackets. Now this one here is reasonably sturdy, but uh, it's a bit hard to see there, but this one on this side is moving a fair bit so I think those solder joints have cracked it's not a great way of uh, securing a board in the first place and there's not really anywhere we can put a screw to sort of firm it up so I'll go in there just remove the solder have a look at it and see if I can just fold the brackets over the tabs on the bottom side to just try and get a little bit more strength out of it uh, we'll check the valves for microphonics there are five valves in this model one two three four five we'll check that they're in the right positions there's no visibly bulging caps. There's a few that are on a bit of an angle, but I think that's from manufacture more than uh, any bulging at the bottom. They were just on that funny angle when they applied the glue. Uh, there's this hot melt glue. Well, actually, that's silicon securing all the larger components, which makes it fun to change them. You can see big blobs of silicon on anything that might rock back and forth. This is a base amp, so it's susceptible to a fair bit of vibration. We'll check all the connectors, see that they're uh, they're in good condition as you probably saw in the last video, the focus right preamp, um, anything with high current, and this is a high current application, uh, they can be expecting a little bit much from these connectors. And uh, check the fan bearings fine, check that it's running fine and, and kicking in when it should. We'll check the, uh, I was going to say emitter resistors, the source resistors because these are MOSFET output stage and just check that they're all within tolerance. Uh, we'll check the bias on the output stage which is a bit fiddly on this model because they don't give you a spec. Normally you're, you're given a, a voltage drop across these to measure and set to. There's a tech note floating around for this amp that tells you to read the, the mains draw current uh, and it says set to somewhere between 0.8 to 0.85 of an amp current draw from the mains but it doesn't tell you what voltage <laughs> so that's meaningless <laughs> I'm assuming it's for 110 volts but without a definitive way of knowing that um, doesn't mean much so we'll uh, we'll just check that they're balanced and we'll, we'll check for crossover distortion and the tech note also says do not remove all crossover distortion so as you can imagine this is a great sounding amp <laughs> with crossover distortion in the output stage but hey when your thing's cranked up, uh, you don't really hear a little bit of crossover distortion in the note decay when you're pumping the thing full volume. So, 
Uh, this is the heat sink. It's essentially just a U shape of valley. Pretty piss weak, really. Not a lot of surface area there. That's all it is. It's got a couple of little pressed out fins there, which would do two thirds of fuck all. Um, but that's that's a pretty anemic heat sink at the best of times. Fortunately, MOSFETs have a effect where they increase their resistance as they get hotter. So they sort of, not really, but they sort of stop themselves from conducting themselves into oblivion, unlike bipolar transistors which do the opposite, they conduct better as they get hotter, so they, they run away and, and cause issues. Um, that's the two second uh, summary of that. You could get in deeper, but it doesn't make for interesting videos. <laughs> um, we'll check the valve sockets are clean and not showing any evidence of overheating. We'll check all the soldered connections, uh, particularly on the bottom of this board, but we I don't really want to remove all boards, but I kind of want to check the bottom of this board and there's no way to do that other than removing it. So I also noticed the transformer's a bit loose. You can spin it around there pretty easily, so we'll tighten that up. Check the fuse ratings on the secondaries as well, where they've got them. Check all the rail voltages, you know, the usual. So anyway, Let's get started on removing this front board to start with, and we'll go from there. We'll just check the fuse rating on that secondary fuse down in the bottom there. It should be uh, 125 milliamp, slow blow. I've got this uh, half a tweezer where I've bent the end over. Set of tweezers that snapped. Perfect for removing fuses. You can get under them and lever them out. T125, she looks intact. Let's just measure that quickly. She's indeed intact. Put that back in. In a low current fuse, we don't have any burn marks or anything on there, so that's good. So we'll fire it up before we uh, take it apart so we can see if there's any strange behavior. Well, we've got the board out. We've got a bit more evidence to, uh, to look at any work that needs to be done. So we've got the current meter, we'll fire it up. Fan starts straight away. Sounds a bit grumbly. The speaker relay hasn't tripped yet. 46 watts, it's going up a little bit as the preamp valves start to conduct as they warm up. Settling at 48 watts. Still no speaker relay. There it goes. It's a pretty long delay. We're settling at 50 watts. That's not quiescent. Let's just turn that down. 50, yeah, 50.8 watts. So that's 0 0.34, 0 0.35 amps. So that's probably about half of what that bias uh, setting measurement was. So being that we're on 240 volt mains, I'd say proportionally that's that's about right because uh, we would be at half the amperage as a 120 or 110, 120 volt country would be expecting but same amount of wattage so about 50 watts right Let's give it some signal just got a like 400 hertz sign going into it attenuators working Gain knobs working without much scratchiness. Scratchiness. Master a little bit scratchy, but not too bad. Turn the tube gain knob down, and it almost like motorboated for a second. Something funny is going on. Treble a little scratchy. Mid range, okay. Base, okay. Yeah, 
Something funny going on there. Oop, just had the relay click. Oop. Okay, so we've got an issue, probably a cracked solder joint on the output board. We heard the fan, I'll just turn that down. Heard the fan go up in revs, and we heard the relay, speaker relay click. Just from flexing the board. Now it's not doing it. And that was from manipulating that valve. Don't put your hand in amps. Unless you're an idiot like me. So it's a pretty well-known issue on these things that the circuit board's pretty crappy, very thin traces, similar to the Fender Hot Rod series. Um, no through-hole plating, just single face. Um, and uh, they crack their solder joints ridiculously often. Despite the little globs of silicon everywhere. So we'll try and pinpoint what was triggering that relay to click. Could be the connector. These uh, Molex style, oh not Molex, whatever they are, the 4mm 3.96 pitch connectors. Sometimes the wire gauge isn't suited to the actual crimps. So they're only just touching their contacts. These look okay though. Just heard some crackling. Alright, so having a quick look at the schematic, for some reason the fan derives its voltage uh, through the heaters, <laughs> I guess it might use them as a, as a voltage dropping mechanism, uh, so if you have a blown heater your fan stops, well the output stage is still conducting, um, granted your signal can't get through but your fan relies on the integrity of the connection to the heaters in the valves. It's a bit questionable design practice there, but anyway. So that crackling we're hearing and the fan changing its speed or cutting out, um, that was the voltage going through the heaters be, being intermittent. So that could be from the valve uh, pins being dirty or the connection to the circuit board underneath. So I would be pretty confident uh, that we should probably pull this circuit board and have a look at the bottom side of it. I'm trying to keep the cost down on this one, but I also don't want it coming back. So we want to be thorough. So I might pull that and have a look at the bottom and we'll go from there. We'll also check these, um, as we said, the, the connectors and we'll check everything's hunky-dory. But all in all, um, other than giving it a lot of gain, and checking for microphonics. I'm pretty happy there's no ridiculous hum issues or anything like that. Um, one of the issues I've noticed is um, the input jack has been replaced by someone with a Switchcraft 11, which is fine except it's a non-shorting jack. So when you've got nothing plugged in, that input's floating and it's not grounded. They've also done a pretty crappy job of wiring and I'll show it to you in close up in just a moment but that's something else we'll replace with a shorting jack. Now that there is the kind of background noise you get with nothing plugged in. That should be nothing and it's because that jack isn't shorting the ground when it should be.
Alright, so with the uh, output and the gain turned up all the way, things very microphonic, picks up hum. When you put your hand near the valves, of course, that'll be microphonic just because it's cranked and the input's not grounded. There's no intermittency or massive shifts in noise level. So I think. Uh, That board's probably fine, but I'll probably pull out and check the bottom side anyway. So here's that input jack. Um, that looks almost like this valve melted that wire, but I, looking at the diameter of the burn, I think um, that was actually a burn from when the jack was installed. The solder joints dry, almost no solder on them. And they're starting to fray and break. It's just too heavy a gauge of wire really it's almost like they've stripped a bit of speaker lead and pulled the wiring out of that same goes on the ground side but particularly this jack is not a shunting to ground type which means that when there's nothing plugged in it's not shorting the signal to ground so there's excessive noise so we'll replace that we'll redo the wiring with a proper shorting jack so they're only preamp valves but um they're still valves, so we'll check there's no residual high voltage anywhere on this board, or that one. 10 volts, 3.6. We should be right. No visible burn marks, that's good. They're looking pretty fresh. get to removing this board. Remove the uh, all the pot nuts on the front panel as well as the input jack which is just floating around free now. One more screw hiding under that ribbon cable and that screw is a little bit chewy so I think someone's been here before. Someone's played knifey spoony before. And that, that EQ board comes along with it. Yeah, so someone's reflowed some solder joints on that switch, which is the mute and EQ switch. Obviously, someone's replaced that jack too. So yeah, that's duh. That's why they removed the board. And the solder joints on that bracket are indeed cracked. You can see the little rings around it. Let's see if I can get closer and get that in focus. Probably not. see there those solder joints are cracked and allowing that bracket to move and there's plenty of depth on those those pins to fold them over for a bit more mechanical support so we'll do that while we've got it out and that LED is rocking back and forth too might have been damaged from when the last guy put, reinstalled it could just be vibra vibration from not being fully Better down on the uh, circuit board, that's the just power switch, uh, power light indicator. So that's our aftermarket switchcraft jack. You can see the uh, questionable wiring I was talking about there. Pretty dry solder joints, not really good coverage, and you can actually see through the eyelet still. It's not filled. And it's the wrong type of jack. So we'll redo that. 
Initially they uh, had a factory circuit board mounted jack here, but that probably failed and then they, they said, oh, we'll, we'll make it a bit more sturdy by putting a uh, switchy on there, switchcraft, but um, wrong type. So we've heated up the soldering iron, may as well start with the input jack, just get rid of that hectic wiring. We've got the proper one here. This is what I'm talking about with the, the shorting to ground. If you connect that inner contact there to ground, when there's nothing plugged in, the input's shorted to ground, so you get no background noise or, or uh, stray signal coming in. Bear with me, I had the wrong type there. So that's the one I was after, 12A. That's L12A. The only difference is the bushing length. See that? It's about two mil longer. That's seven point something. That's nine point five, I think. Uh, they're actually significantly. The nine point fives are significantly more expensive. So we'll just use this one because it's only got to go through one layer of steel. These longer ones are good for plexi amps, where you've got to go through, say, two, three mil aluminium and then a two mil layer of plexiglass. Um, and it's actually got the reach there that you can still use a lock nut, the lock washer, sorry. Uh, whereas this one's perfectly fine for this purpose and about half the cost. So to wire this one up, just get some 22 gauge wire. Take it like about 20 mil off. It's more than we need. Tin the end of it. Always tin your stuff. Just a nice even layer like that, no blobs. Run it through both. A bit of a bend on hook on there to uh, find its way through the second eyelet. Upwards, fold it back on itself. Good coverage, fill the eyelet. Cut off the excess. Now the shunt and the shield are grounded. I'll just get a bit of uh, whatever colour you choose. I prefer white personally for signal. Don't need to take as much off this time, only a quarter of an inch or so. It's only going through one eyelet. Put a hook on the about halfway. Feed it through the eyelet. And solder. There we go. We don't need much length on that one. So, literally that much. All we've got to do is make it to, to ground there and signal there. So, it's heaps. Take about an eighth of an inch off to go through the circuit board. Twist and tin again. Flip this one over and take out the old wires. I'll just cut off the excess. Clean 
want that excess solder. Pads are still in good nick. That's good. And that's all we need. Nice and compact. And the uh, contact not bumping into the circuit board like it was on the old one either. So the jack was a little bit hard to push in. The plug is a bit hard to push into the jack. Got to be precise about these things. So I just noticed a few little. Uh, Half moon starting to develop around the uh, the headers. We'll just reflow them. This is still leaded solder. It must have been pre the uh, the ch change to lead free, so we can just reflow along with it. We'll go onto this LED power indicator. Just push it all the way in till the solder sets. I might reflow the valve connectors too, just uh, the valve sockets, just just for the hell of it. Really, the shift to um, through-plated holes was a vast improvement for reliability in in all bits of equipment. Single-plated, single-side-plated uh, boards, tiny little pads, just recipe for disaster. It's it's the most common failure, really on any of the uh, Ampeg and the Fender and the Marshall stuff. And we're not gobbing a shitload of solder on there, it's still, there's still kind of fillets. Just a tiny bit more than the uh, wave soldering offered them when, when they were manufactured. Now for these brackets, i get my larger solder tip, desoldering gun tip. Get on there and actually remove the solder from the joints. So now that is mechanically fastened without any solder, it's, it's a lot firmer. And the solder just makes the electrical connection to ground. This does have traces running underneath, so we won't push it into the board surface. We'll just push it over until it's about 30 degrees or so from the board surface. Solder the bio boys. I can actually see there is a connection to that pad there. It just goes to the LED, but it goes to show it's not just purely a mechanical pad. It's actually connected to the circuit. All right. So you can see now there's almost no appreciable movement between the two when they're flexed. A lot stronger. Well, we've got it out, we'll just check the connections on the back of the slider, slider pot circuit board as well and they all look good. There's no funny behaviour there either while we were testing it, so... Having a look at this connector, just give that a quick clean. The eraser that's got the weird blue bit on it that's slightly, slightly abrasive. Just reflow this connector as well, we can just... Just start to see a little bit of movement there on the pins. Maybe do these switches as well while we're here. This one's got a large ground plane on it, so it's going to take a while to heat up. They don't have thermal relieves on them. Like they should. Yeah, so it's struggling. Got to turn the iron up for that one. See what I'm talking about. So where there's a large ground plane, you've got to put a bit more heat into the board to reflow the solder joints and it dries really quickly or sets really quickly afterwards. Modern PCBs have a thermal relief, so there's like a little moat around the pin. 
and it's just connected by four little tabs so it doesn't suck all the heat out of your iron as you're trying to solder it but this board's a bit old school in that respect Ooh, almost missed one there snap in filter cap and a visibly cracked solder joints so it just goes to show the old silicon doesn't do much a little pool of silicon around it didn't stop it from cracking this one's floating in midair, so that's really not great. Uh, it looks to be original, yeah. So when we heat up the solder there, push it down. Do it to the other one as well. It went up by a good eighth of an inch. Hard to see now because the camera's been a dick. But, uh, right there. Oh my fucking god. Yeah, there. Use your imagination anyway. <laughs> so we'll apply some new solder to that. So there's another solder joint. It's barely holding on, and that looks like it's been that way from the factory. The pad is almost non existent, it's that small. And it's only holding on to the far side of the pad, so you've got like. 0.1 of a mil of contact area there so we'll reflow that make that one one area again and and this this side of this uh, that's a jumper on the other side of the board it's the same deal it's barely holding on it looks like there's, there's not even really any solder coverage there it's hanging on by a thread so it really pays to just go over these things and just just look really closely because all of this stuff will have effects if it's not solder probably and this uh, mid frequency selector switch, the pins, it wasn't bedded properly in, the pins barely made it to the other side of the board so they were starting to crack as well. So we've just removed all the solder, pushed it down as hard as we can. And solder the two outer ones, making sure that it's hard against the board. Therefore mechanically supported as well as we can and then solder the in-between ones much better yeah I'm glad I removed the board I think removing the power amp board is definitely a given now and probably will be on every future one of these that comes in just on a side note nothing screams quality like a resistor installed like that <laughs> We'll put that board aside now. I'm confident we've uh, solved most of the issues there. We'll give the pots and stuff a lube before reinstalling it. But for now, we'll remove the power amp board and have a look at the bottom of it. So to remove this board, it's not just a matter of the screws. We've got to remove probably that, that DI board there and all the fasteners on the back. Mm, might be able to leave the speaker connector although it's probably easy to just remove that from the from the outside and leave it connected and we should be able to pivot it up without removing the connections to the the power transformer we'll just we don't want to over overstretch anything just want to be careful and gentle and try and do it without excessive labor just notice we've got a snapped off um, line output level knob there. And that's got a pull pot functionality for a ground loop, ground lift, sorry. So that's not ideal. That's probably a specialty part. It doesn't look like your average pull pot. It's got a round switch body. Just looks like a dual gang pot unlike the ones that have the rectangular switch hanging off the back. Let's see if that's an issue with the customer. He, he didn't even mention it, so I doubt that he uses the line out. He probably uses a separate DI. Got a 15 mil socket there for the plastic nuts. If you need more torque than that to do them up, or you're gonna strip them. So just a socket, hand tight. Often you can undo them by hand without a socket, but uh, 
get the occasional one that's trying to hang on a bit. Two speaker jacks as well on the other side. We've got one 8mm, no, sorry, 9mm. Which is weird. I'll do the IEC connector because that's fixed to the board. Number one Phillips for the speak on. Number one Phillips for the DI XLR plug. It's a socket, but it's male, so it's a plug. <laughs> I have to remove that. Which is a 12AX7. There is everything's 12AX7 except for. Uh, v, what is it? V, that one. <laughs> it's a 12 AU. Oh, when I opened it, there was uh, rattling around inside the thing, and I just realized that that was from the previous guy taking this board out, because they're the only two missing. So those solder joints are probably stressed as well because they were getting pulled in line with this XLR which is actually about a millimeter, millimeter and a half in front of them which is why the washers should have been there. So that's, that's good, nothing conductive rolling around at least. Have to note that the fixing screws going through the heat sink are actually longer than the others. So we'll set them aside differently. And now the board's mobile. There's not enough give there. We're going to have to remove the transformer. Yay. All right, different day, different t-shirt. Magic of video. Flip the board over. First thing you notice is this uh, giant squid looking thing. That's a circuit board. Copper on the bottom. Um, shielding, I guess. Uh, in heat shrink, sealed off with some wires escaping. It's tapped into the ground here. Tapped into the speaker outlet there, so that's what the speaker is connected to on the positive terminal. It's tapping off the positive and negative 15 volt rail for the op amp, just tapping directly off that TLO 74 there, and it's tapping into the uh, base of the transistor that turns the speaker relay on and off. So that must be another protection add on. So this had temperature protection as well as uh, voltage rail OK protection, but it didn't have DC offset protection. So I'm guessing that this detects any excessive above a certain um, threshold of DC offset on the speaker. And if it's above whatever threshold they've set by those components, I'm guessing that's cuts off the relay. But without reverse engineering that, there's no real way of knowing and it's glued very firmly to the board. There's like no movement there at all. So it's not even silicon. Uh, and I'm not really interested in removing that. It works. Don't know the story behind it. I'll ask the owner, but I don't think he knows either. He might have mentioned something there, but... Asked around all the, uh, the brains trust, and no one's seen that before, so no one thinks that's a factory modification, and none of the service documentation amongst its service bulletins mention, mentions anything about that modification. Whatever it's... Whoever did it has done it very well. I probably would have added less wire, but... They've gone uh, some pretty attention to detail there. So let's just let sleeping dogs lie. We'll just go over the rest of the board and look for any cracked solder joints. We'll clean up the bottom of this dust coming from the fan and just check everything's hunky-dory. This board is actually probably solder connections anyway, in slightly better, con better condition than the preamp board. So it looks like we might be able to just um, give it a clean up, clean the valve sockets, maybe reflow a few and uh, put it back together and see how it performs. Okay, you can see um, <clears throat> these holes here are to allow air through, so the uh, high power resistors on the other side have a bit of airflow to cool them down. And here's the lead for that particular resistor, which is a 10 water. And you can see there's a little line there, a little line surrounding the, um, the pin. So that solder joint's starting to crack. 
heat accelerates it. So if it's connected to a, a component that's dissipating a fair bit of heat, they're usually the solder joints that um, degrade the quickest. And you can see there's a bit of board discoloration in that area, showing that uh, the board's been affected too by the, the heat on the other side. Ideally, they probably should have been lifted off the board a bit further. Or if you want to be real keen, mount them to a chassis and run wires to them so that the chassis acts as a heat sink. But again, no, almost nobody does that. So, all right. So I've gone through and uh, reflowed all the solder joints where they looked a little bit suspect. So now we're ready to just maybe clean the flux off a little bit and flip her over and clean the valve sockets. And here we have an example of the time-honored tradition from most manufacturers of putting high-powered resistors right up against temperature-sensitive capacitors. And you can see the foils pull back a little bit, the plastic wrap, because it's shrunk from the heat. And they're only rated at 85 degrees, so we might change them out with some 105s at least. Um, not a lot we can do about the position of them, but at least just starting from fresh again. <sighs> Look, everyone does it. Um, I should be a bit less cynical with manufacturers when I say everyone, manufacturers shouldn't do this, but they all do it. Well, they probably don't all do it. It's just the ones that don't do it, we don't hear about because they're still working. So so it's just about to pop the preamp board back in. Now I noticed uh, on that switch there, rotary switch, there's a crack in the housing. So we'll see if it's, uh, if it's operational without any issues. And if it's presenting issues, well, I don't know. Don't think that's going to be easy to find that part, but we'll have a look around. You never know. It's not your standard part, that's for sure. Uh, so we'll give the uh, switch gear and the, the pots a, a bit of a clean and uh, reinstall it. And the uh, sliders as well. We'll just give them a lube and a clean. And reinstall the board and we'll start some testing. We can't forget to clean the valve sockets. Just grab a couple of toothpicks for that. Just the round ones, not the square ones. A little bit of alcohol on the end. Do about three pins. You can see the crap coming off the uh, contacts there. More alcohol and continue. When you've done one socket, just flip her over and use the other end of the toothpick to do the next one. All right, everything's back together. We'll just fire it up and have a quick listen, make sure all the pots are cleaned up and nothing's uh, misbehaving. The fan still sounds a bit funky. Settling at 46 watts, it still hasn't clicked the relay. Waiting, waiting. There it goes. Oh, we've got signal. And in intermittency. Awesome. So I've got a feeling that's the effects loop. Check all the front panel controls aren't causing it. Just give it some square waves so I can figure out if the EQ is working properly. Need some harmonics. That's the overall level. Alright, so that's cool. Uh, back to the sine wave. Pot. 
that's the effects loop. Jack, disengaging when we plug something into it. Let's plug an actual jack into it. Oh, uh, plug, sorry. So I've just got one of these adapter things. isolate the signal so it seems to be a parallel effects loop we're actually getting fan noise when we do that when we plug into just the effects return fan noise if that's a common problem of course you wouldn't just plug into the effects return with a an open cable and that's with the master all the way up interesting might have just discovered a bit of a quirk on this one So we've got the signal generator turned off. We'll crank the gain all the way up. Master all the way up. It's very quiet. We'll unplug the input. As we were getting before, lots of noise. Now we've got that new jack in there. Dead quiet. So that's good. So everything seems hunky dory. Just a little bit of scratchiness on that master there towards the end of its travel where it doesn't get used much. So I'll grab a bass cab and we'll have a play uh, in the method in which Ampeg intended. So I've got my test cabinet here. This is one I built. <coughs> It's got my logo there, see that? Laser cut. It's got a Delta Light uh, 2512, I can't remember the number, but um, the Eminence Delta Light uh, Neodymium driver. No tweeter, just a 12 inch. Um, I've got other cabs here with a tweeter, we'll try it with one of them before we send it out. It's ported. Ported. <laughs> That's 18mm birch ply, nice and compact. You can lift it with one arm, no problem. And they're designed to be stacked up, so you can have two if you want a bigger gig, or just one if you're doing a uh, rehearsal or practice or small gigs. So, but they're handy test cabinets. My brother cuts the cabinets, and I assemble them and coat them with Duratex and this, and uh, install the grill and the speaker. It's got some wadding in there as well. Uh, it's got a tuned port, and they were supposed to have an option for a tweeter. But my brother done fucked up and <laughs> made the baffle a mirror version of what it should be. So that speaker should actually be over this side. The speaker was supposed to be that side, the tweeter was supposed to be here, uh, and the port down there. So that way you can just drill a hole if you want the tweeter. If you don't want the tweeter, forget about it. Anyway, we'll plug that in and we'll have a listen. Gain all the way up. Tube gain all the way down. 
Just seems to add some low mids. Get a pick out. I think this guy plays with a pick. Set this thing up again, it's moved a bit with the weather. It's drawing about a hundred watts there. One seventy five. Still running cool as. All the classic bass ripoffs. <laughs> Sounds alright. We'll take some uh, measurements, then we'll put it back together and send it on its way. Thanks for watching, champions. See you uh, on the next one. Hopefully, it's a little less mundane than this. What can you do? Life of a tech, eh? Take it squeezy.